The first issue that needs to be clarified is the actual strength and solidity of the Twin Towers, since both the 9-11 Commission and the debunkers have made extensive efforts to depict them as extremely light and fragile buildings. The outside of each tower was covered by a frame of 14-inch wide steel columns. The centers of the steel columns were 40 inches apart. These exterior walls bore the majority of the weight of the building. The interior core of the buildings was a hollow steel shaft in which elevators and stairwells were grouped. Le torri di New York invece erano sostenute da un'intelaiatura esterna, da sottili nervature d'acciaio, insomma erano come dei parallelepipedi vuoti. Il World Trade Center era una struttura leggerissima, era la massima espressione del grattacielo leggero, come, come lo chiamano i tecnici. C'è un solo altro edificio che io sappia, che è la, quella che si chiamava un tempo la Sears Tower a Chicago, che usa lo stesso tipo di struttura. Dopo il World Trade Center nessuno l'ha più usata. As we shall see, all these statements are false. Contrary to traditional skyscrapers, where all the support columns are equally spaced, in the Twin Towers, part of the supporting columns had been moved towards the exterior wall, creating a large column-free space available for rental. For this reason, the external structure had literally become a grid of steel columns made with prefabricated blocks that were mounted on site. These are the thin steel nerves mentioned by debunker Alberto Angela, 244 steel columns placed approximately two feet apart, which supported 40% of the weight of the towers. Far from being two empty parallelepipeds, the internal structure was comprised of 47 steel columns, so long and sturdy that a special factory in Japan had to be built in order to assemble them. It was the core structure to support the majority of the weight of the building, 60% of it, and not the external structure. The core structure seen on the left is what the 9-11 Commission has called a hollow steel shaft. This is the same core structure near the base of the tower. The core structure was an actual, extremely robust steel skyscraper built within another skyscraper. The core structure housed the stairs, the elevators, and all other services needed for the functioning of the tower. The inner walls of the core structure were made of simple layers of sheetrock. A long series of steel trusses connected the core structure to the external one and supported the floors. The floors were also prefabricated rectangular pieces covered by a thin layer of concrete. The internal and external structure connected through an umbrella-like structure called a hat truss, which kept together the towers and bound them from above. The idea that this kind of structure is fragile and therefore no longer used after 9-11 is disproven by the new Building 7 built by Larry Silverstein. A strong central structure supports the majority of the weight of the building. Long steel beams support the floors and connect the core structure to the external one, allowing for large column-free space in between a very similar concept to the one used in the Twin Towers. Most importantly, the debunkers forget to mention that the Twin Towers were built with a structural redundancy of three to five times the weight they were meant to support. This structure was capable of holding three to five times the weight. These buildings are built to handle several times the load above them. So those perimeter columns could handle five times the load above them, and the core columns could handle three times the load above them. In addressing the solidity of the Twin Towers, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology stated that its 244 perimeter columns made it one of the most redundant and one of the most resilient skyscrapers. On the same subject, the architectural firm of Roth & Sons wrote, the building as designed is 16 times stiffer than a conventional structure. The Virendil trusses would be so effective, according to the engineer's calculations, that all the columns on one side of a tower could be cut, as well as the two corners and several columns on the adjacent sides, and the tower would still be strong enough to withstand a 100 mile per hour wind. John Skilling, the structural engineer who designed the Twin Towers, stated, Live loads on these perimeter columns can be increased more than 2,000% before failure occurs. In particular, the Twin Towers were designed to sustain the impact of a large airliner traveling at 600 miles per hour and still remain standing. Interviewed in 1993 by the Seattle Times, John Skilling stated, We looked at every possible thing we could think of that could happen to the buildings, even to the extent of an airplane hitting the side. Our analysis indicated the biggest problem would be the fact that all the fuel from the airplane would dump into the building. There would be a horrendous fire, a lot of people would be killed, the building structure would still be there. And it was. After the impacts, both towers remained standing, showing no major effect on their stability. 
Furthermore, NIST has confirmed that the initial jet fuel fires themselves lasted at most a few minutes. This means that from that moment on, the only available source of fuel for the fires was common office furnishings. And, as we know, regular office fires are not hot enough to affect the stability of a steel structure. No steel frame high-rise building has ever collapsed due to fire. In over 20 years, um, I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. These kinds of designs have performed extraordinarily well over uh, history. In fact, until this occurrence, no building had fallen down because of fire. Furthermore, NIST estimated the combustible fuel loading was somewhat lower than found in prior surveys of office spaces. The number of interior walls, and thus the minimal amount of combustible interior finish and limited bookshelf space account for much of the differences. There was no reason for the towers to collapse at that point. With a structure that had clearly withstood the impacts and with less than average office content to feed the fires, both buildings should have remained standing, allowing for the evacuation and rescue of everyone who had survived the initial impacts and the fires. Instead, both buildings suddenly collapsed from top to bottom, one 56 minutes after the impact, the other as much as one hour and 42 minutes after the impact of the plane. Why? NIST also maintained that the impact of the airplanes widely dislodged the fireproofing from the trusses, hastening the process that eventually caused them to sag. It should be noted that NIST made the dislodgement of the fireproofing a necessary condition for the towers to collapse. The buildings would not have collapsed under the effects of the airplane impact and the fuel, jet fuel ignited multi-floor fires. And it only the reason it collapsed is because the fireproofing was dislodged. The truth is that NIST itself admitted, in their own report, to have no proof for temperatures high enough to seriously weaken steel. From the NIST report, we read, of the more than 170 areas examined on 16 perimeter column panels, only three columns had evidence that the steel reached temperatures above 250 degrees centigrade, or 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Only two core column specimens had sufficient paint remaining to make such an analysis, and the temperatures did not reach 250 degrees centigrade. No conclusive evidence was found to indicate that pre-collapse fires were severe enough to have a significant effect on the microstructure that would have resulted in weakening of the steel structure. In other words, NIST openly admits to have no proof to support their own theory. In conclusion, the known facts are Steel melts at about 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. Softening can begin at about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. Except for three isolated spots, NIST admits to have found no proof of temperatures beyond 480 degrees Fahrenheit, which is less than half the temperatures needed to seriously weaken steel. On the other hand, there is multiple evidence that the temperatures needed to seriously weaken steel were not reached for a sustained time in the Twin Towers. The first one is that a group of 16 people managed to descend through the area devastated by the impact without obviously being burned alive. One of them is Brian Clark. And when we came to the 78th floor, the, the last layer was standing, but it was cracked. And there were flames licking up the other side of the wall like this. It wasn't a roaring inferno. I, I sensed that the flames were maybe starved for oxygen right there, you know, in the interior. We kept going and we got onto the 74th floor when we got down that far. Normal conditions. The lights were on, fresh air coming up from below. Attivissimo has maintained that these people managed to survive because in that part of the building, the stairwell runs on the side of the tower and not through the center. In truth, stairwell A traverses to the side of the tower on the 82nd floor, but Clark and his colleagues were on the 84th. This means they descended two floors in the center of the tower before crossing over. Furthermore, one of Clark's colleagues went back from the 81st to the 91st floor before descending all the way to the ground. Ron DeFrancesco, who went in the 81st floor with me, he went up to 91, caught up to the people, laying down on the floor, to thinking that there was fresher air at floor level, he made his way back to the stairs. And so I started to run downstairs. And so I ended up on the ground level and I went to walk out. Had there been a temperature of 1100 degrees around the stairwell, nobody would have been able to go through it alive. Secondly, 
There is a series of thermographic images shot with an infrared camera showing temperatures much lower than those needed to soften steel. This is the North Tower seen from below. It's 918, about a half an hour after the impact of the first plane, and the indicated temperatures do not reach the color yellow, which means they don't exceed 100 degrees centigrade or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the South Tower, some 15 minutes after the impact of the second plane. Here too, the indicated temperatures do not exceed 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But the major problem with the sagging trusses theory is that it doesn't make any sense from a mechanical point of view. Even assuming the temperatures were high enough to make them sag to such an extent, where did these relatively thin trusses find the strength to pull and then break apart a supporting structure much larger and stronger than they were? The phenomenon suggested by NIST is called thermal expansion. If one assumes that the trusses were forced to expand downwards by the vertical structures resisting the push, it means they were weaker than the structure and they would have never found the strength to pull it inwards. If instead the trusses sagged on their own, so weakened by fire to become unable to support their own weight, where would they find the strength to pull and break apart the same structure that had easily supported them when they were strong and healthy? In either case, the idea that the trusses alone would have been able to pull and break apart the external structure makes no sense. As we shall see, the external structure did bow inwards before the towers collapsed but a much greater force than their own must have been applied to those trusses for them to be able to pull and break apart the structure they were attached to. What caused the initial collapse of the upper section of the towers under the rest of the building? As we have seen, there was a bowing of the facade before the collapse, but the trusses didn't have any strength of their own to cause such a massive bending of the external structure. If explosives were used, however, and this part of the core structure was made to collapse first, then the trusses would have had enough strength to pull along the facade and to initiate the global collapse. In fact, it was observed that the antenna from the North Tower begins dropping slightly before the top section of the building collapses, which indicates the central structure was destroyed first. <laughs> 